Hey guys, finished testing that game yet? I've got another one I need designed. We just finished level three and need to tighten up the graphics a little bit. Great. Hey, I can't believe we got jobs doing this. I know, and my mom said I would never get anywhere with these games. Project Arrhythmia is a musical bullet hell game about running tests inside of an AI in order to find the cure for a world-ending virus. At least I think it is, because the story mode isn't actually out yet, so most people just make up their own stories in the built-in level editor themselves. And lord knows I did! If you're watching this video, it's probably because you want to learn how to do stuff like this! And even if you don't feel like torturing yourself by learning a new form of animation, well, stick around, because I tried to make this video as funny as possible and I'd like to do well on this platform. This video is going to be a comprehensive guide about everything that there is to learn about this editor, spanning from making simple attacks to animating whatever the heck this is supposed to be. This is going to be a video that covering everything that the community knows so far about this editor, I mean, where else are you going to go get this information on how all this stuff works? Some sort of official guide that the game links to? Oh, okay, wait, listen, listen, that's not- that's not even official- wait, no, please! Before beginning any kind of work, the first thing that you want to do is get yourself into a good mindset. This editor isn't anything like, say, Mario Maker. The stuff that we're working with here is actual animation, and some people have used this to make actual animations instead of just video game levels. Remember that everyone learns and creates at a different pace, so don't get frustrated if you're not making any kind of progress. Someone like Crazy Train can spend up to a year and a half working on just one level. Meanwhile, someone like Monster or MC Stars can produce a great level in the span of a month, or even shorter. It all comes down to both the amount of free time you have, no what you're actually doing and learning to not procrastinate 24-7. You know, like, like me. me. One of the easiest ways to help stay on task is to either set a time limit for how much you work in a day, which is what I usually do, set it for something like 1-2 to two hours, or stream your progress in the game's Discord server. Speaking of which, many of the top creators frequent the game's Discord, especially Editor Discussion, a channel which is pretty much active all the time. So, you know, as long as you're not annoying about it, they're nice enough to help out with level creation, from tips about making animation smoother to providing assets. Now, one way that I categorize level makers are either structural creators or discovery creators. Structural creators like to plan out the entire level before they even open the editor. For them, this makes the process a lot quicker so that they don't end up spending like thousands of hours staring at a blank screen. Discovery creators are people who make the level as they go, letting the ideas slowly flow as they progress through the level. Making a level is more about what you want to put into it and how. How. This is your artistic vision, and like any other form of art, it takes practice, patience, and dedication. Even if you're not a structural creator, it's definitely not a good idea to start a level just because you like a song. Have a loose idea of at least what you want before starting a level. Like, what kind of theme you want your level to be around, what moods you're trying to communicate with it, what colors you use, and how they complement the song. Now that you know what kind of level you want, it's time to get the music! In order to actually use the music, though, it needs to be verified, meaning you have received explicit permission from the music artist. Alternatively, if it's licensed in Creative Commons, then it should also be fine. Some artists are cool with their music being used like this, some aren't, some don't respond entirely, and some of them do this. For the latter three, it's more than likely you will never be able to use their music. Another group you're going to need to check in with potentially is the artist's record label, and make sure that they're okay with their music being used. Examples of this include Monster Cat and No Copyright Sounds, both of which are disallowed. No Monster Cat Gold doesn't count, we've already checked, that's not actually licensing, that only applies to YouTube. The actual Monster Cat license costs way more than that. Also, you have to renew it yearly, otherwise they take it down. Oh, and if the song was ever played on the radio, you can just forget ever using it. You know, unless you know where to look. Also, if you're going to be using a remix of a song, you'll have to verify the original musician, the musician who remixed the song, and the record label. This means that to date, the only legal form of Megalovania that we can use is in Night Drive, because it's not actually credited as being a Megalovania remix. Because the Undertale and Deltarune OSTs are not okay. You can also check the verified song channel in the game's Discord to see if the artists and label have been verified. Otherwise, you're going to need to get someone else to email them. Also, if they've confirmed that they don't want us using their songs, your level will be automatically deleted if it is. So probably don't try to risk using a song that hasn't been verified yet. 
Not that that ever stopped us. After you've gone through the proper legal channels to adequately compensate the artists for their hard work and dedication to the music industry, it's time to convert. Oh, yeah, you can't use MP3 files. I mean, why would you want to use MP3 files? Convenience? Now, I'm going to be using Audacity because it's free and relatively easy to use, assuming all you're doing is converting a file. First off, you want to go and select Import and then select the music file. Now, sometimes it's a good idea to add some silence to the beginning and end of your music so you can put a special thanks or give objects time to load. What you do for this is click on the beginning of your music, go to Generate, Generate Silence, and then choose the specific amount of time you want to add, and hit OK. After you've made any edits that you want to the song, go to the file, hit Export, and select Export as an OGG file. By this point, you're good to load up the file in the editor, and now you can finally begin. Do you want to make one yourself? Well, then let me show you how to get started. First, you... Figuring out what to do when starting can be kinda difficult, so let me walk you through what I do when first starting a level. First, you're gonna need four things. Control C, Control V, Control D, and the scroll wheel on your mouse. Oh, wait, what's that now? C control X to cut? Yeah, sure, buddy. Now, one of the first things that you'll probably notice are these pillars that appear in the background whenever you create a new level. Some people use them, some don't. I personally kind of find them ugly. And apparently the devs do too because they're cutting them in the next update. I'll go over how to create them soon, but first let's just get rid of them. Go to BG and select Open. This lets you edit the pillars in the background that the game calls, uh, backgrounds for some reason. Y you pretty much don't need them, so go ahead and click on the first one and just spam the delete key. The game won't let you delete the last one for some reason, so here's what you do. Set the scale of the BG to 0, 0, and then move it, like, really far off screen. Like, so far you'll never interact with it even in a side-scrolling section. Now, if you WANT to create a background object, go to BG and select Create. You have some options here, position X and Y control what the background object is on the screen, scale X and Y control how wide or tall the object is, and rotation is the obvious one. But keep in mind that if you're going to have these BGs fade, then they're going to fade into whatever the first color is. Reactive config lets you control exactly what part of the song the background object can react to, like a visualizer. The slider underneath controls how much they react to a specified part. And lastly, fade just makes it fade into the background. This actually does look kind of good in some circumstances, but again, be careful of the color. Okay, cool so back to the important stuff. Now all you're left with is a pink square. Let's just go over some quick visual descriptions, timeline and scroll wheel at the bottom, the preview screen where you can click on objects to select them, and this, which I will get to later on. Also, uh, this one saves, this one quits, and this one uploads. The, the rest don't matter. Okay, to start with, go to your timeline and click on this square. Then just drag it really, really far down the timeline. Like, far away enough that you won't need to care about it for the moment. Now you're going to want to duplicate this with Control D, which conveniently copies an object onto the next layer, unless of course you're on the bottom layer, in which case it just spawns on top of the duplicated object. Anyways, you want to just go and make a bunch of copies, I'll explain why in a bit. Finally, the bar. Time. Click on it to skip to the beginning of the song. The play buttons. Plays the song. Speed button can be reset back to normal if you click on it. These things are layers. You usually want to divide your objects between each layer so that they keep the timeline nice and clean, such as keeping a character model on one layer and simple lasers and bullets on the other, etc, etc. Event check I'll go over later, marker is just useful for keeping track of stuff and you can delete it with a right click, prefab I'll go over later, and object. Go ahead and click on normal and it's going to spawn, well, an object. They spawn wherever the blue cursor is and also spawn in... kinda weird. Now I'll explain what you're doing in a second, but once it's spawned in, you're going to need to go to where it says time of death and just change that zero to uh, whatever you want. Now it will actually show up. When spawning in an object, you get your choice of square, which is the default, circle, triangle, my least favorite shape in the editor, and hexagon. Persistent means the object lasts forever, i.e. the object never despawns. Decoration is a normal object that doesn't hit the player. Helpers are semi-transparent objects that don't hurt the player, and empties are completely invisible objects that don't hurt the player. And now, we're finally left with a 2x2 two two square. Nice. That's cheap! <laughs> Shape go away! Clicking on that first object brings up this chart, and if you're like me, it's probably going to intimidate you, so let's take this one step at a time. Remember that if you're having any trouble, you can always just look at the rollover text box on the left. You can also show and hide this text box using Control H. First, the object property's name. It's always a good idea to give unique names to each and every object, so that prefabbing is a little bit easier. Next up is time of death. This determines when the object will despawn, and you're gonna want it to despawn because otherwise the game will go into a cardiac arrest if there's too much on screen. Last keyframe kills the object whenever it hits its last keyframe, which you only have one of right now. Last keyframe offset is whenever the last keyframe is, plus whatever you put into this box. 
Remember when I asked you to change it? Yeah, for whatever reason it's set to offset zero. Fixed time is the simplest. It exists for however long you need it, and then it dies. Finally, song time automatically syncs up the kill time to whatever specific point you want in the song. It's good for despawning stuff at a synchronized time, such as despawning bosses. Huh, that's kinda big. It'd feel wrong if only one object was taking up an entire row, so let's change it. These three circles will instantly collapse an object so it takes up as little space as possible. The white line that's next to the three circles will kill the object at whatever time the cursor is set to. There's also a white bar above it which sets the object's start timer to wherever the cursor is. I'll go over parenting in the next section as well as origin, for now let's just stick with the tabs. The tabs are used to move between layering pages because Control x and Control v are broken, however the render depth bar is important. This is going to display which object is on top of another, but be absolutely careful because if they are on the same layer, then it is pretty much a coin toss as to which object will be on top, and that is going to be a whole mess. You right click to create a keyframe. Pretty simple and easy to understand, so don't ask me why it took me three days to figure this one out myself. When creating a keyframe, there are four columns you can place it in. Movement, size, rotation, and color. The first keyframe you place will automatically take the attributes of the first one in its row. The rest of the keyframes will simply look to the keyframe before it to choose what attribute it has. Now anyone who's worked with graphs should already know how the XY plane works, and if I have to guess by the age range, it probably includes most of you, so I'm going to focus on randomization. Obviously, this changes where an object spawns in, but what you might be confused about is the interval. This interval exists to limit the number of places the object can move to, so let's say for example we have a 0, 9 and a 0, negative 9. If we set the interval to 3, then the object will only be able to move every 3 units. That being 0, 3, 6, 9, and all of the negatives. Directly next to it is Toggle, which only randomizes it between two places. And finally, Scale Randomness, which is difficult to understand. Scale Randomness works in a way that rather than changing both the X and the Y value, instead they both stay the same and it is a multiplier that gets randomized for the two. But I've never messed around with the position version of this and it kind of scares me. Scale is just the size of the object. This is where you're going to use that third type of randomness, because using regular randomness on scale is just going to have it coming out all sorts of weird. Rotation is pretty self-explanatory, but unlike the other ones, rotation is added not set, meaning that putting two 90 degrees turns together will turn it by 180 degrees instead of just turning it to 90 degrees and then stopping. Because of this, sometimes randomizing rotation can be annoying and you'll have to play around with the numbers for a bit until you get the angle that you want. The final one is color, this one's the most self-explanatory. I'll get to my issues with color in a bit, but for now just know that it can get semi-tedious. Once you place a keyframe, go ahead and click on it and you'll get this little drop-down menu. This is the easing menu, and it is very important. This will automatically change how your object gets from one point to the next. Compare these two bullets and you'll realize just how ugly linear looks as an easing. In fact, one massive tip I can give as a creator is to be very careful about how you use linear. You only need it for movement that remains consistent. Keep in mind, there are other ways to spice up consistent movement. Tip number two is to avoid using the inouts, i.e. inout quad and inout sign, inout circ. Instead, just place an out movement wherever you want it to go and an in movement directly between the two with half the movement, then just move the keyframe around until it looks smooth. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong to use the inouts, but you know, it definitely does help with adjustable smoothness. Another massive tip is the instant keyframe. As I had to learn this the hard way, instant is not actually instant. It's just a really fast linear. The best way to improve on your keyframing is to figure out what the other creators are doing and to replicate that yourself. Now, my preferred method is watching Song of Storms at 0.25 speed with the editor open at 3 in the morning like any other normal person spends their weekend, obviously. However, we do have an entire channel in the game's Discord server dedicated to showing off prefabs called Asset Showcase, so now you can see how they did it and apply that to your own work. However, it's really not a good idea to just download and use attacks directly from the channel, as people have gotten in trouble for plagiarizing before due to this. If you do choose to use something directly from Asset Showcase, it's something that's meant to help you animate, not a pre-made attack. Now, once you get to a much more advanced stage of creating, you're going to want to look into things like the 12 principles of animation. Now, you don't need to know them all, of course, if you're a beginner, but for now you can just focus on the basic ones. A couple of examples of this are squash and stretch, i.e. keeping everything at a consistent scale while giving it weight, anticipation, buildup, timing, and the list goes on. However, there's a very special quirk of Project Arrhythmia, which is that as of recording this, it is hard capped to 60 FPS, meaning that any animation that you make also has to account for its 60 FPS-ness. 
I'm reading over that recording and I'm just realizing that I just made up a word right there. As such, you're not going to be expected to take in all of the principles of animation because, you know, it's not direct animation. Specifically, this form of animation is called tweening, where rather than drawing each object frame by frame, you're instead taking already drawn frames and simply moving them around. And the reason that I brought up the game being hard capped is 60, because unlike most popular animatics that are recorded in 12 or 24 FPS, this game is going to be recorded in 60 and you're going to need to account for that. This stuff gets pretty complicated and it's stuff that's talked about even once you're really high up into the animation industry in general, but if you take it one at a time, things shouldn't feel too overwhelming. So we have this bar. It's randomized. Now what do we do with it? Well, we'd probably want a warning to make sure the player doesn't accidentally get hit by it, so how about we Control c Control v that, and it's not following the attack. Let's change that. What you want to do is click on the attack, go to the search bar, find the name of the warning, and click. But not before you make sure that you disable all of the other stuff. Parenting, in its simplest term, is effectively grouping objects together. Thanks, Rhyme, not for the explanation. I, I'm sorry if I butchered that. Once an object has been parented, it will become the child of the parent. From here on, it will follow its movement, size, and rotation, all of which can be enabled or disabled via this thing. The only property that can't be inherited by the parent is color. No, why would you ever want to parent something by color? Oh, you moron, you buffoon, you imbecile. Two important things to know. First off, instead of treating zero zero as its origin, now it will treat its parent as its origin. What you can do is you can disable movement parenting and the object will no longer act as if the parent is its origin. Second, scale is multiplied. Because all objects spawn at a scale of 2, this means that it can get really messy with the scaling pretty fast. Let's say I have two completely new objects. Let's say I parent this first object to the second object. Because all new objects spawn in at a scale of 2, the child is now 4x4 four four instead of 2x2. Two two. Luckily, scale parenting is disabled by default, so you should be good on that front for now. Let's say we want this circle to fire a laser. Well, we can try expanding the circle, but it looks kind of ugly now, doesn't it? Using this, we can set the circle to have only its x value expanding from the center. Just keep in mind that if a parent has its origin shifted, then so do all of its children. Finally, offset. This is to delay the rotation, movement, or size of an object. Sometimes it works really well, other times it looks really ugly. If you're unsure about whether to use it, once again, I suggest looking to the Discord for feedback. Now, are you ready to copy and paste this effect to every single beat of the song? No? Good, neither was I. Let's prefab it. Highlight all of the objects that you used in the attack. The highlight function can sometimes break, by the way, just reload the editor until it works eventually. And finally, hit prefab. Click create new prefab, name it, and then click prefab again. Look up the prefab you just created, go to the second list, and click on the white button. Click on the prefab in the second list that you need, and now you're done. Just go to the point to the music where you want to add it, and click slash. Of course, this is going to start at the beginning of the animation, and you probably don't want that. Offset is used to change when exactly the object spawns in when you press slash. So if my warning lasts one second, then I'm going to want to put in negative one, and now it will spawn in directly when the attack starts. Also, because spawning in prefabs can have a bit of lag, it's recommended that you slow down the song if you're going to be pressing slash repeatedly because it can cause a bit of lag and you want to make sure that it syncs correctly. And that is everything to know about prefabs, for a beginner anyways. Now assuming you already know how to make a bullet, here's a pretty simple one for you to just sort of look at. It's time to get into some design philosophy. This one's more of a stylistic choice, but you don't technically need an individual warning for each bullet unless it's moving really fast. If the player knows where it's coming from and can prepare for it, then you should be good. If you want to add something like particles or trails to a bullet, it can be done by either manually placing them directly on top of the bullet, or parenting a bunch to the bullet and having them move backwards while shrinking or fading out. This is also a similar philosophy to how we get these buzz saws to work. Now, how do you get something to move in a smooth sine wave, like this for instance? Well, simply make an extra parent that moves up and down, and there you go, you're done. Again, if you need any kind of extra movement, just add another parent to it, because this stuff usually comes up a lot. But what if you don't want just one bullet, but a collection of bullets? To start, go ahead and make your little bomb spawning area, then make a parent connected to the bomb. Spawn in your bullet of choice and have it move true north, then clone the rest in, moving in the other cardinal directions. Finally, copy and paste all four bullets and their parent, and then simply rotate the parent. Add as many bullets as you want like this, and make different patterns for it. You can even have some kind of super parent to which all bullets are parented to, to randomize the rotation of all of the bullets. Be warned though that this can lead to a bunch of objects spawning in at once, which can 
kill the editor in its current state. Well, luckily there is an easier way to lower the object count, and by easier I mean more annoying. Just change the start time of each object by adding a keyframe where the rest spawn in. You can use comma or period to sync the cursor up wherever the previous or next keyframe is so it syncs up better. You can also accomplish this with the arrow keys directly next to the trash can. In this way, you don't have all of your objects spawning in at once, and you can get rid of a lot of lag. All you need to do is do this for every single object one at a time. Still too easy? Let's make it harder! Have you taken trigonometry? No. Too bad! Using this formula for the x value and this formula for the y value, you can effectively replicate any kind of degree that you want. I hope you have a calculator on you! Maybe one day I'll optimize this prefab. Oh cool, OL gave me access to his knight's prefab from Gint version 2. You know, the one that commonly crashed the game because of how many objects it took up? I'm gonna open it to see how we made them. But let's change the color first. Never had one, but somebody told me this is a really good way to start your diet. Now, in your time making levels, only about 10% of your time is going to be spent in the effects tab. Ironically enough, 90% of the reason why people think your level looks good is because of the effects tab. Now, effects are great and all, but if your level isn't fun to play, people are gonna take notice. So I recommend saving all of your effects for last to make sure the gameplay is up to snuff. The exception for this is camera and rotational effects, which are usually important enough to where they have to come first. Examples of this would include side-scrollers. One thing that's always weird about the camera movement is just getting the easings down, but you have to think about it sort of as a filmmaker would. Consider things like framing, rule of thirds, where the player should be looking, and more importantly where they should be moving. Camera rotation can also be cool because having a slight rotation in your level can give it an extra sense of movement. Just don't do this and you'll be good. Another thing to avoid is pushing the player into a text. This is pretty common if there's a lot of screen movement, but it's even more common with something like zoom. Zoom is pretty cool when used in small doses, so uh, don't go overboard. Shake, like zoom, is fine when used in small doses. Typically, most people use it with an instant keyframe to start it and then killing it off with linear or some kind of out easing. What's odd is just how strong it is. It goes all the way up to five, but you don't even need that. You probably shouldn't even be going past one, to be honest. Heck, for most cases, 0.4 is plenty of shake. Theme is a crucial aspect to learn, not just because of how you use it, but because of how to subvert it. You see, because of theming or something, PA's color wheel only lets you have up to nine colors at a time for the sake of theming, so the workshop isn't flooded with ugly levels, even though, you know, making it 11 or 12 colors would also be pretty cool in the next update. The way you get past this is via making more themes. Now, the themes tab is kind of broken, so what you have to do is click create new theme, pick your colors, select OK, and then select that as your theme. Be careful because editing a new theme will temporarily delete all of your other themes, which you may think is a glitch, but it will go back to normal if you select one of these buttons. Seriously though, don't close out of the color editor. Now picking the right color is going to be tricky at first, but I recommend doing some research into color theory or just seeing what other people are doing in order to get some sort of aesthetic that looks nice. Also, because PA uses hex codes, it may be a good idea to start looking into color pickers, which can more accurately recreate images. But you know what's really annoying? Wasting three whole slots on different shades of yellow. Well, let me ask you this child, have you ever heard of our lord and savior, the black and white helpers? Since helpers are semi-transparent, you can layer them on top of objects to shade them. This helps a lot with reducing color usage, which can be very helpful as it's a way to get around just how limited the theme colors are. It's all about creativity. Several creators are using it for a grayscaling effect, which is just taking every color and moving it closer to black or white, and I was able to get this lightning effect with it. The rest of the effects follow the same formula of use it in small doses and play around with it until it looks good. The only two things I want to say are that Vignetti is weird as heck to use because of and second, setting the grain size to zero and increasing its intensity can give this strobe effect that gives people seizures if it's strong enough. Turning on the color makes it rainbow, which looks cool. One last tip is that for whatever reason, grain doesn't affect pure black, which can be used for some cool setups. Finally, the checkpoint setup. Just like, if you yourself struggle to get past certain portions, you either need to decrease the difficulty or add a checkpoint somewhere in there. You may notice that this section was a little bit shorter than the other ones, and that's mostly just due to the fact that event keyframing mostly comes down to creator preference. It's a style thing, mostly. I would say just work with something that you're comfortable with, because some creators use a hell of a lot of keyframes, and other creators can get away with using, like, five of them. It's really just gonna be up to you with how much you want to use. And speaking of creator, preference. Why doesn't mine look like that? <laughs> Alright, look, let's just get this out of the way right now. We're not here for fun. None of us are. You're here to make your OC popular, right? Hey, look, no shame for me. My first exposure to the game was Medusa and a New Dawn. So, how do you make your boss? 
Well, first off, it's recommended that you already have a working design for it, because unfortunately, designing a boss by the seat of your pants really doesn't work well. Designing a boss mostly comes down to sketches, but really consider all aspects of a boss, including themes, attacks, character arc, personality, etc. Remember that any changes you make to the beginning of a story can influence the end of it. Back to bosses, let's get into some design philosophy. Bosses are not that special. In reality, they're just a really, really complex parenting chain that lasts for the entire level. A really complex parenting chain. A really, really complex parenting chain. A really, really, really complex parenting chain. Being honest here, you can probably get better character design advice from a different video specifically about character design, because it usually applies here. But two things I like to do to help them immediately stand out are to limit yourself to two to three colors for designing your boss, and have about two to three unique features about your boss that are immediately noticeable. And finally, the silhouette test. The silhouette test is basically just shading your boss black and seeing if it compares to anything else. Let me give you an example. Who do you think this is? And who do you think this is? And who do you think this is? Also, try to avoid over-decorating. Like, detail is amazing, but there's just sort of a point to where you don't know what you're looking at anymore. Another thing that many people would do is keeping your boss at a 3 fourths angle. Many different kinds of cartoons and animators will do this when characters are looking at one another so it doesn't look off, but this is mostly absent from PA design due to all the bosses looking forward. But it does help to think about how your characters would be viewed from different angles. A lot of bosses in PA end up being symmetric, but what you choose to do with your boss is ultimately up to you. Always remember that bosses are just another aspect of the level, and you need to consider how your boss moves in relation to the level, and how much you're willing to put into it. Along with this sentiment of the boss being a part of the level, you need to make sure that every part of your level is complemented to the boss design-wise. Generally speaking, the more parts of your boss that are moving at once, the better. This can even be in minor things such as slight up and down movements, slight shakes, minor squats and stretch, etc. But let's say you need your boss to do some kind of complex movement. Simply add another parent. The community is currently adopting a three parent system when it comes to base movement. You start with an X invisible object, then it becomes a parent to a Y movement invisible object, then Y becomes a parent to a scale and extra movement, and then that becomes a parent to everything else. Technically, you can swap the X and Y parent, whichever one comes first should be the one that gets used more. Invisible parents are the key to making a good boss work. There's one of the entire face, just the eyes, the mouth, the two arms. It helps to only have to animate one thing instead of both at the same time. It can also involve a lot of copy and paste in keyframes, depending on what you end up doing. Here are some basic tips I make when making a boss level. Number one, don't parent bullets to your boss. It's just gonna make the level very unfun to play when it starts moving around. Number two, lag busting. Make sure that when you're done animating, you kill off all objects that are no longer in view, because not killing it can cause a lot of lag. Number three, always have two sets for each extra thing on your boss, i.e. arms or weapons. When your boss starts moving around, the arms are gonna get really hard to animate if they're parented, so always keep a second set which isn't parented to anything, just in case you need it. Then if you need to swap between the two, you can always just use 0-0 scaling with the instant movement to simply swap them back and forth. It will take some experience, but sooner or later you'll start to get the hang of it. Dialogue can also be another issue, whether it's placement, easing, or just the fact that the game only supports the English language. Finding ways to set your writing apart can be difficult, but again, it just comes down to finding what fits. Also remember that the GUI can get in the way of text, so be careful of that. Speaking of text... Okay you guys, so welcome to the first day of hell. Wait, what? Welcome to lab. Text objects are single-handedly the best and worst objects in the editor. Best because with them, you can make all kinds of different creations. Literally objects not possible to obtain anywhere else can be yours. Gradients, circular gradients, cool looking patterns for stretching out letters, a CCTV effect, entire images, Scott the Waz. But if you're just looking for text, Nchart made a great video on dealing with text, including the different commands that you can use like C-space, bold, strike through, color, etc. Now, why did I say worst object? Well, you can't click on text objects from the preview window. You have to find them on the timeline. Sometimes setting text to zero zero and scale does this, but only sometimes. I have documented instances of gradients changing sizes depending on whether or not you're in preview mode. Changing the size of a circle gradient causes too much lag even when nothing else is on screen. Text objects don't naturally harm the player. You have to layer objects on top of them to get that to work. I mean, this one, this one's actually kind of understandable, but you know, still. Gradients have a habit of breaking whenever you try to switch versions. All again, this one's actually kind of understandable because, you know, updates. The text works with Unicode characters, but they don't show up in the text box you type in for some reason. Oh yeah, that's right, Unicode characters. Not all of them are going to work, but just find the wiki page for it and play around with it for a bit. The text background is also one of the most common kinds of background because they're very simple to make, so always look for ways to experiment. I've gone ahead and pasted some common text objects in the description and in the pinned comment, so keep an eye out for them if you need it. The easiest way to actually make a gradient is to simply flip the bar above the enter key and stretch it out. Not perfect, but it works, and it works with all text 
text for some reason. As for images, there's this website that someone made a while ago, I don't know if they still play the game, but just follow the instructions they left on the website and you'll be good. I don't know why render depth is set to 30, maybe if you messed around with it enough you could layer objects over the player, which is a thing you can do if you hack the level file. Like every best feature in the game. And that should be everything you need to know. And it only took several days to write and edit. It's been a year. Uh, do you want to go and introduce yourself, I guess? Uh, I don't know how to, um, that's, uh, who am I? Uh, like, I don't know, what do I say? Uh, I do <laughs> alright, alright, yeah. <laughs> now, you know what, you're a OL666 guy who made Black Hearts. Alright, that's yeah. the introduction. I'm leaving, I'm leaving all of this unedited in the video. This is all staying in. Uh, oh my god, yes, amazing. <laughs> I played JSUB with just written tapes and bits. Um, gosh. I hate to, like, like, only the fact that I know that I'm being recorded is like. Damn. You're gonna edit this out, right? Take your, take your time, take your time. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so I played the JSUB, and then immediately after finishing the story, I just went on YouTube and started, like, looking if there's a level editor, because I really wanted to try and make my own level. It seemed. I guess uh, kind of simple, like it seemed like a simple game to make a level out of. After a few days of like uh, looking, I found uh, Zilak's editor tutorial for PA, and I was like, oh sh this game has PA and it's almost like JSUB, shut up and take my money. And then I joined, like like after, yeah, like I immediately bought the game, like day one, I just immediately opened the editor without playing any levels. like. Damn. <laughs> Only later, like after finishing my first level, I started looking in the workshop and looking like what other levels sound like. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so it was like always about like just being able to make the levels for you, it wasn't really like... Yeah, like uh, literally my first message in the PA server was like, hi, I joined for the, like, I was interested in the level editor, like... And then I guess that led to the creation of uh, Before the World Dies, so... Uh... Yeah. I guess, to follow that up, uh, how much do you remember about actually, like, making Before the World Dies? Like, your experience with Oh, I remember, like, almost everything. I mean, it did take me, like, three days, I think? Like, barely a week, I don't know. Like, okay, so I remember, like, I when I first started, I knew, uh, like, absolutely nothing. Like, I made uh, a bunch of, like, small tests for, like, lasers to understand how parenting works. I had like no experience at all with animation, I had no idea what a keyframe is. Uh, yeah, like I, I, I remember spending like like three hours or something just making the first warning. Yeah, yeah and I slowly like started getting used to the editor and understanding how it works. The natural experience yeah. for growing as a PA creator. <laughs> yeah. Three hours on the first attack. Yeah, it wasn't even an attack, it was just the warning. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> with the stuff about how the like level itself came together, did you have any like plans for it, or did you just kind of just like start making it? Uh, uh yeah, I did have some plans. Like, uh, like uh, before buying the game, like, like I did listen to this song. Like, I already knew I wanted to use this song, like before the world dies, because I thought it was cool. And like, I listened to it a bunch, and I got some ideas. Like, uh, yeah, I remember, like, you know, that one section with like, well, like the screen rotates and it shoots a bunch of like squares yes. from the middle. Yes. Yeah, that was like uh, planned ahead and like. Uh, oh. Uh, the thing with the hammers and like the spike balls as well. Yeah. Right. Alright. Okay. So after finishing it, I was uh, yeah obviously very proud of it, even though it wasn't that much. <laughs> um. Really, what like... was the question? What was the question again? Uh, yeah okay so when i finished the level i was like like i don't know i looked back at the, the entire level making process and it was really really fun like like i really liked the idea of just making something and, uh, i don't know how to say that uh, how do you feel about before the world dies now it's bad <laughs> it's like very bad yeah i mean i can <laughs> i can guess but uh, yeah <laughs> Have you ever considered yeah, uh, like, trying to update the level, or just do you just feel like leaving uh, it as it is? Nah, I'm, uh, I want to leave it as it is. It's like, yeah. yeah right. my, my first level, I shouldn't touch it. Ooh. Um, making Medusa. Oh, really? That was like, 
Yeah, I really, really enjoyed making that because I came up with the idea quite a long time before actually making it. I was still working on like Pale Gimp or something. So like the <laughs> entire level like in and of itself or just like... Like did you have like one like, moment uh... where it was just like... You had like a lot of fun just like putting like a specific attack in or just like designing something or just watching it all come together? Um, I'd say... Uh, maybe that one, you know that one attack uh, in the second drop, where it like floats up in the air, in the air and like does the funny thing with like the circle that slowly shrinks and then it explodes everything in there. I don't know how to explain that attack. Alright, which part of the uh, level was it again? Second drop? Oh, that! Yeah, no, that yeah. part's fun! That 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 part's like yeah. really cool. I... Yeah, it was really fun to animate. Nice. And so, like, just being able to like see that attack was like. Yeah, because I had the idea for a very long time. Like, I just, I've been thinking about it like days and nights. Like, just thinking about that one attack and like the entire level in, the, in general. Like, so when I got to like when I got to finally make it, I was like very happy, like very excited. Yeah, fair. I had a very good workflow on that level as well. When I'm talking about like growing as like a creator, like what is like a moment when you were just struggling to make something and then you just realized something and then well, it was like a whole lot simpler for you and you were just like able oh. to make like a lot better animation and you saw like a drastic improvement. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so actually, um, the, I had the moment uh, at some point while making a sofa tension when I actually like had like almost like a a mental breakdown or something because I realized I for the first time I have something that I literally don't know how to animate and it looks bad and like I don't know like by that point like I got so far and like I just kind of almost felt like giving up entirely on like level making or something I don't know like, like you know the part with Jester when he first comes to the screen uh yeah that like uh, like, like uh, well, not, like when not not like, like when he opens the wings, when like the the drop starts, and then he starts shooting lasers, and it looks really cool. Yeah. yeah. So like, I had no idea how to anim animate that. Like, I legit like I tried so many stuff, and like I sat for hours like trying to figure out the animation, and I failed. Like, I absolutely failed. Oh. And like, I don't know. For the first time, I felt like there's something I want to make, and I can't make it. And like, th this shit broke me. Like, uh, I don't, I didn't know what to do. And then I remember, like, um, I don't remember how exactly, somehow it got to crazy, like, uh, crazy train. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Um, and he offered help. And I was like, yes, please help me. And like, uh, like a few hours or days later, I don't remember, um, he showed me, like, progress on the animation. Yeah. Like, he just made the shooting laser stuff. So he just made that and then sent me back the level file, and I was like amazed by it, like i never seen such smooth animation before. Damn. And it was like something way beyond what I usually did, like in a new dawn, or like, uh, I don't know, exoplanet or nautilus or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then like I just, like, uh, once again, like I felt like, like how am I gonna compare myself to this, like compare the rest of the level to this. So I just, I took the animation, um, and I just looked at it for hours, like, like, I don't know, maybe an entire day, like, uh, I literally, like, memorized every single you, keyframe in it. You spent an entire day <laughs> looking at a single attack. Uh, yes, like, absolutely, like, I, I was, like, broken completely, like, I looked at the attack and, like, I looked at the keyframes and animation and, like, basically analyzed everything about it, like, what makes it so smooth, and I found out actually a lot of things about it, like, you know the trick with, like, the inside and outside thing yeah. I did? Like, you probably mentioned it in the... Yeah, I, th I think I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's where I learned about it. Like, before that, I didn't know about that that could be done. Oh, like, I didn't think about it. Oh, nice. Levels before we used, like, only in-out sign or, like, single uh, keyframe for motion. Yeah. Uh, which looks uh, kind of bad. Yeah, because it's sort of like... And, like, after that, like, I learned it, and then I took that attack that Crazy made, and then I remade it myself. Damn. Basically. Nice! You still have the original yeah. Crazy version, or, like... Uh, yeah, I should have it somewhere. Nice. Uh, I can probably show it. Hold on, let me just, uh... Oh, 
okay, so when I'm staying up late analyzing the stuff that you've made, I don't have to feel as bad because you've done the same thing with crazy stuff. Got yeah. It. <laughs> nice. Yeah, basically, like, I keep telling this to people, like, they, they should do that because that's literally the way I got so good at making animation. Later on, I had, uh, I did the same thing with another crazy animation, and I got even better. And then I met Pergin 3-2, which is, like, the smoothest shit ever. So smooth you had to delete an entire attack because the game couldn't handle it? <laughs> yes. Take us through your thought process for, like, the most recent level that you made, that being, like, Mutant. I'm not gonna say, like, oh, the... Yeah. I'm not gonna yeah. say the one uh, you're working on right now, obviously, but, like, like from idea to, like, you, like, eventually, like, releasing it. You don't have to go, like, step by step, but yeah. just, like... Yeah. Okay, so I first placed the first object, and then I placed the second object, and then... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Coming up with level ideas, usually, um, like, I come up with the level idea itself a lot before actually starting making it. Like, I have the level, like, when I start making a level idea, I usually have it a few months to, like, a year in my head before. Damn. Like, I have every, like, like a lot of stuff planned out, like, at least, like, 80% of the level is planned out in my head before I start making it. For Mutant, um, actually, like, uh, the idea was originally, uh, I was in a VC with some friends, and we wanted to make a collab level where, with, like, a bunch of main villains from stories. That was the idea, like, just a bunch of, like, a boss rush with main villains. And, like, I took the idea, and, like, obviously they didn't, they, we ended up not making the level. Yeah, because... Um, because they had, like, no ideas for a song or, a, like, our motivation to actually collab. Yeah, fair. But I took the idea and then, like, I, I don't remember when I came up with the idea for Mutant, but I just listened to Mutant and I realized it fits very well for it, I guess. Yeah, that, so you had the level idea um, first, followed by, like, the song itself, basically. Yeah. And then I started like listening occasionally to the song and like uh, thinking of ideas, like coming up with ideas. And then like, uh, I think I first came up with the idea for uh, King Crazy. And originally, like it didn't have the shadow theme in it. Like just a classic boss. Yeah, rush. just a boss rush. Yeah, just a boss rush. Like uh, I remember, I had the, I had also the idea for like the the pitchforks and shit, like in the starting section. Oh yeah. Oh those. Yeah. And yeah, then... that was like very clear in my head, like uh, like the entire section, and like slowly I started like coming up with more ideas. Like I listened to more parts of the song and came up with like which boss could fit for it. Like for example, like uh, Kit Kat was like very easy to come up with. <laughs> yeah, for like the, the... yeah, because it's like the simple part, just like the li yeah. little like upbeat cheery part at the end. Yeah. Obviously, you're not gonna have like 100% of the level planned out, but just like when you hear a certain part of the song, do you just like run through like different possible attacks that you can use for like a specific section? Or... Um, yeah, something like that. Like I, when I get to a part with an attack that I didn't plan before, like uh, it's just listening to the part over and over until I come up with an idea. Sometimes it can it can take weeks, like just of not doing anything but listening to the part, like. It's just a rule for myself that I set is like I never walk on a uh, on, like I never skip parts and then come back to them later because it could it could make the level very messy. Oh, oh wait, so really? like so you do it like all in one shot, like you know? Yeah, I do it all in one shot, like uh, one after another. Like I never skip something. Do you ever go back to certain parts just to like tweak tweak like minor? Uh, yeah. Sometimes like I suddenly come up with a small detail idea or something, then I come back and edit it. But I'd rather not do that. Usually. That's a hard question. Hmm. I mean, there's a lot of factors to it, but I'd say for me, the two, uh, I guess the three most important things are um, animation, gameplay, and uh, and sync. Making sure that it's like all synced up to the music itself? Yeah, synced well to the music. Like, for example, something I really hate seeing in levels is like a level can be very well animated and very... Uh, good looking um, but if the sync is bad like let's say for example the song has a lot of uh, funky notes and then the syncs are like the attacks are only synced to the beat that triggers me a lot like I can't watch that kind of thing uh, I feel like I might be guilty of that at some point <laughs> yeah. I mean you're, you're not the only one I was guilty of that as well at some point I mean there are parts of levels that can um, be synced only to beats usually I'd say calmer parts yeah. Oh, yeah, just stuff that kind of fit, I guess. Yeah, like but the, for the most part, yeah. The 
the style of the level in and of itself look like which deck work and which don't. It makes obvious sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh wait, actually I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> almost spoiled the level. Uh, which one would you say is like the most important? Uh, animation, gameplay, and sync. Which one would you say is like more or less important? Or do you think that they're all equal? Uh, I think they're all equal. I kind of I want to say gameplay. Like obviously gameplay is probably the most important, but like. I don't know. Mm. Like only gameplay is kind of boring. <laughs> like, like obviously the level could be very fun, but like if it looks bad, like it's bad. But You're gonna like yeah, I, do any I have a lot of plans. Like, um, like wait, did you want to ask something more specific? Like obviously you plan on like finishing Blackheart, right? You, you, you yeah. do plan on that one, right? Plans after Blackheart, essentially. Do you plan on like taking oh, this yeah. anywhere else? Oh yeah, I have a lot of plans for uh, after Blackheart. Cool. Um, obviously, like uh, in between levels and uh, after blackout, obviously I have a lot of normal, like like random level, like, boss level ideas that aren't related to any storyline. Do you plan on like going into like the animation industry or like anything like that after this, or just like? Ooh. Um. Yeah, I do. Oh, really? Like I don't know how and what I'm gonna do, but like I want to. Like that's definitely something I like. I enjoy doing, and I'm really good at. Do you ever think, like, we could find a way to somehow incorporate PA into, like, like, actual, like, actual in industry animation or something like that? Or do you um, think... I don't think so, uh, mainly because PA is based on, I don't know, music and, like, like copyright stuff, I don't know. Yeah. Do you still see yourself, like, 20 years down the line, like, still making levels uh, long past, like, high school and college and all that stuff? And you're just like... I mean, I'm already past high school, I'm in the military, but like, uh, like I don't know. Like, honestly, with like the amount of time it takes me to finish a level, I see myself still still <laughs> making Blackout 20 years like, ahead, but like... <laughs> no, like um, you're just like sitting on your deathbed and you're just like discussing whether or not a certain attack actually like fits in a section. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. Like, as of right now, I'm still enjoying it. So I'm not planning on stopping anytime soon, but you never know what happens. Do you have any like specific advice or warnings to aspiring creators? Like people looking to like also make the good stuff? Uh, ooh. I don't know. Mm. That's a hard question. Advice? I don't have a good uh, advice at all. Damn, really just hit them with that, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we got like a lot of people, obviously, that are like looking up to like Blackheart, because it is one of the biggest series, regardless of like thoughts on like its actual quality. It is one of the biggest, so obviously a lot of people are going to get inspired by it. If you had to like go back in time and ask yourself, or like tell yourself something about the editor, what would you like tell yourself, essentially? No. Uh Actually, I have something very specific. <laughs> um, I tell myself that I can, uh, you can press shift and then drag objects down. Yes! Yes! Because I didn't know that until, so for the entire time I was making the levels uh, while dragging objects with the like very annoying, uh, I don't know how to call that, like Fine. the slider. Like the, yeah. Yeah, the slider on the menu. Like, that was the most annoying shit ever. Finally! Like, literally the one piece of advice we have to tell anyone, and it's that it's just about some specific function that the game never tells you. Why? Yeah, yeah like, like when I found out, like, I was, like, making a new dawn. Like, I, I made some, like, quite a lot of levels before that. And when I found out about that, like, I just died a little inside, like... Uh. <laughs> It's it was not even, awful. It's not even, it's not even anything like, uh, always try your best or like practice. It's that, hey, did you know that there's like a shift function? You can, you can like stack objects on top of each other really quickly. Uh, I'd say like, I wouldn't tell myself, uh, an advice on animation, I guess. I don't know. Like, I think the process of learning was important. Yeah. Yeah. That's important to take in. Like have everyone yeah. like, sort of. Learn on I guess own. it's also very inspirational for other people when they see like that I started very bad and then I got good. I don't know. And that's why you haven't deleted uh, Before the World Dies, because you want people yeah. to see how bad you were. <laughs> yes. Alright, awesome. 
Uh, yeah, that's the end of the interview. We're we're pretty much done. Yeah. I think it was like, don't be afraid or ashamed to ask other for help when you need it because that's the way I learned all I know and got to where I am today. Or some. Now that you know how everything works, it's time to put it all together. And nothing can go wrong. Oh no, it all went wrong. This next part is more so a collection of tips I've picked up rather than a well put together essay, but I still think this is stuff that needs to be said. A good way to get rid of backgrounds is to parent it all to an invisible object and instantly shrink it all to zero zero, because sometimes the color can get messed up. Keeping on the subject of backgrounds, each progressive layer of a background moves slower than what's ahead of it. This is due to how perspective works in animation. Sign and quad are virtually the same thing, the only difference is that quad is harder to select. Lip syncing can be made via sounding the words out loud and replicating the shape your mouth makes. Also, mouth can be made via two semicircles rotated. In order to download or upload a prefab, theme, or level, go to your C hard drive, Program Files 86, Steam, Steam Apps, Common, PA, and Beat Maps. These are where the prefabs and theme files are kept. When working on collabs, be sure to also transfer over any themes because those don't carry over. Prefabs also don't, but they still show up for some reason. You can create scrolling by expanding a prefab, parenting it to an invisible object that follows the screen movement, and then you're done. It's safe to collapse it, just make sure not to do that if you're using the same prefab elsewhere. The selection bug is the worst thing in existence, and I still don't know what causes it, but the only way to completely fix it is to reload the editor. You can create a prefab out of other prefabs. You can't put a prefab inside of a prefab though, so don't try to save that. The cap for a parenting chain is 15, but you shouldn't ever have to go past 10 for most cases. You can change a song by simply replacing the OGG file. Finally, playtesting. Never, ever stop playtesting. Get other people to playtest your stuff if need be. Post clips and editor discussion. Gameplay nowadays is very rarely tested, but you need to emphasize gameplay. Because your level can look as great as a Studio Ghibli animation, but if it's not fun to play, people will let you know when your level comes out. All of these tips are great, but when it comes to putting it all together, what you need most of all is a sense of flow. Each level is its own form of storytelling, and I'm not talking about dialogue. You need to consider tone, difficulty, easing types, color, attack types, deciding which instruments to sync to what, and what attack to use. And especially, how they all mix together are important for making a level. Recently, many creators have been sharing their scrapped slash unfinished projects, but the main theme I see across all of the ones that people want to scrap are a lack of any central idea or theme, or simply not living up to the standard that the creators have now set for themselves. Always strive to improve at your own pace, but remember there is a point where creators could hit this perfectionist slump where they don't really release anything until it's seen as perfect. Well, I'm going to let Kyle Sullivan of Door Monster take it away. Your first priority as an aspiring artist is to become comfortable with making trash and then make a lot of it. Your early work will be embarrassingly bad, whether you want it to or not, so you may as well get it all out of the way as fast as possible and then you can move on to the good stuff. Now I know some of you are probably thinking, well, I have some pretty great ideas and I'm going to do everything that I need to do to make sure that they don't turn out bad. But guess what, past me? They're still going to suck. You don't know what you're doing because you've never done it before. So do it. A lot. And make a mess and learn from your mistakes. And don't worry about wasting ideas because you're going to have way more of those than you will ever know what to do with. Once you've gotten your level to a point you're satisfied with, which depending on what kind of artist you are, will either be literally as soon as I finish this sentence, or forever. No, I, I delayed that perfect. Hey Mountain, guess what? The new update is coming out tomorrow. The, the what? Yeah, the new update. You know, the one that was supposed to come out a while ago. Literally just confirmed that is coming out tomorrow. Uh, Mountain? You like that person? <laughs> After filling out all of the information, the first thing that you probably want is a thumbnail. Assuming you don't plan on just asking someone from the game's Discord server to do it, and they're usually nice enough to do it for free, you should use Inkscape. Now, I don't use it myself, but from what I've seen, it works pretty well. All you have to do now is just state that you own everything in the level, and now it's finally time to JUST KIDDING! Because of a Steam update, you can now only upload levels in the dev mode, so just save, close out, go to the game properties, and click betas. But be absolutely careful, because once you enter the editor, you've officially reached the point of no return. Beyond the lands of default lies a place of beauty, a place of updated UI and smoother frame rates. But be careful, because if you make any changes to it, the game will lock you out of being able to play the level in normal branch. 
Now, I know there's a way to code yourself out of it, but, like, I don't understand any of this. Now, by this point, you probably think you are done, but one practice I always like to take part in is privately uploading my level instead of publicly uploading it. In this way, I can test the arcade to check for any major glitches, which there almost always are. Some common glitches I found are the background color changing, themes being changed weirdly, lag spikes, and most commonly of all, text objects breaking, and it's only viewable in normal mode. The only real way to fix this is to go back and manually delete and replace each individual broken and text object. Or, you know, you could always just leave it there. Just one tiny mistake ruining a perfectly good level forever. After you finish fixing any kind of remaining glitches and maybe giving it one last playthrough to see if anything could use some tweaking or you forgot to add a warning, which you will, trust me, then you're good to simply unprivate the level. But wait, because of the aforementioned glitch, the game does not update the level. If you change versions instead, it will create a clone of this level. This is a simple fix, just delete the old version of the level, then go to the new version and click on public in the Steam Workshop. Now all that's left to do is promote the heck out of your level. This can include making a YouTube video about it on a burner account, or your main account if you need views like me, level showcase in the Discord, and uh, everyone else's server. Now I'd recommend taking about a two week break from making levels because honestly it's not really a good idea to try to crunch something out immediately after making a level. Speaking of which... I don't know. I never thought I'd get this far. Congratulations, you've finally done it. Level published, posted on Discord, YouTube video copyright claimed, and community level creator tag officially gotten. Now what? Well, if you enjoyed it enough, you hop right back into the editor and start making the next level. Obviously, all that's left to do is just to keep pushing yourself as a content creator so that one day people are begging to collab with you, but like... I, I see that as kind of missing the point of being a level creator. You see, the thing is, PA isn't just a level editor. At this point, it's an art program. Like, if you take away the many limitations of this game, like nine colors and layer depth, this game has the potential to bring out some of the most unique and beautiful works of art you can't get anywhere else. It allows for people to create levels like a game engine, and make works of art like an art program, and even tell stories. But you know what all of those things have in common? Crunch culture and burnout! Let's start with crunch because it's the easiest to address. Crunch culture at this point is starting to be seen as the terrible, exploitative work ethic that it is. But what's worse is self-induced crunch. Those nights where you stay up trying to add a couple more attacks because you want to get it done to show everyone how much you've improved as a creator, especially given how fast other people are at making really good levels. You're putting everything you have into this level to the point where it starts affecting your mental health. And I know that because that was kind of my thought process for making Night Drive and Evolution. As much as I didn't feel like making Night Drive, I crunched it out for the sake of having something to my name, leading to the creation of the worst drop in existence. Do you want to know what set Evolution apart though? First, I joined the server and got active feedback from the community, and second of all, I did it over the summer. I wasn't stressed out about making a good product with all the other responsibilities hanging over me because they didn't exist at the time. The burden of trying to do everything at once wasn't really a problem, and it led me to create something I'm actually proud of today, and that's because I always have something to look back on to see how far I've come. Second off, Burnout. Now this one is going to get a little more personal, but I've begun noticing that Creator Burnout has become much more prevalent since I've joined. Sure, you have creators who drop the game over time due to just getting bored of it, but like, to me, it feels like there's about to be a mass exodus of creators. <laughs> But if at one point you did have fun creating and simply lost that spark or don't want to do it anymore, at least let me say this. The point of doing this at the end of the day is going to be you having fun making a product. Yes, it will be stressful, most labors of art are, but you don't have to be the one who completely revolutionizes the workshop. Now I'm going to say something a little controversial here, so please, please don't take this the wrong way. I think the burnout in terms of level creation is kind of OL's fault. Not intentionally, okay, look, not intentionally. Listen, OL, I love your levels, you're a really cool guy, and if you're watching this, please collab with me. But here's the thing. Look at melodic escapism. At one point, this was considered peak PA design. Heck, I'm pretty sure in some circles, it still is. Now look at Mutant. Now, of course, no one is going to be directly competing with each other, but like it or not, your level is still sitting in the same workshop as all the others. Now all you have to do four or five times the amount of work to get noticed than you would have two years ago, and sometimes it can just feel like an unreachable goal. I mean, Technado said the reason he quit himself was because the editor got to such a detailed level that making levels was no longer fun for him. The last time Z-Lucky did anything with the editor, it was for a low-effort shitpost collab. Oh, and I guess also the tutorial video. There's an expectation to always strive for the best, when in reality, most people aren't or will never be ready for that kind of dedication. 
situation. Again, I'm not trying to throw shade at OL666 or blame him for anything. Oh well, the collab is still on the table, my DMs are open. It's simply to tell you to have fun and temper your expectations. Finally, to end off, allow me to give you a couple of tips I use for how to avoid burnout. Number one, do not have PA be the only thing you do. Have other hobbies beside this. And as a subunit, do not exclusively do the editor slash arcade. Have some variety in the way that you enjoy the game. Number two, set a time limit for how long you work in a day. If you're having trouble with procrastination, set a time limit for two to three hours with a stopwatch and that's how long you work for the day. It forces you to sit down and focus and it helps you to get a lot more done. Number three, have other non-gaming related activities to do. Yes, this actually helps me a lot. Number four, look towards other people's work as a challenge to prove to yourself rather than as a challenge to prove to others. Level making should be for you first and foremost, but know that you do have limits and be reasonable. Number five, always look for sources of inspiration. Could be a game, book, show, animation, look for something cool and do what they did. Just remember that a bad artist steals from someone, but a great artist will steal from everyone. And finally, number six, have fun with it. This should, at the end of the day, be your main question. Am I actually enjoying myself with this? And hopefully, if you've gotten this far into the video, you found your answer. And with that, I'm gonna leave you to it. This video took a lot out of me, but it's here now. Whoopee. I'm gonna go binge watch some YouTube. Alright, I'm off. How come you didn't talk about BBM Snap? No.